Let's pray together, shall we? Father, tonight we just thank you for Jesus. We just thank you that he indeed, Lord, is our Saviour. That he is the one who has saved his people from their sins. And he is the one whose loving heart was prepared to come and to die for people who didn't deserve in any way salvation, but who deserved judgment and the eternal fire. And yet his heart was so stirred and so moved that he came in his love onto this earth. He took the form of a servant and he was prepared to die in the most dreadful way, in the most accursed way, because he loved us so much. Father, we thank you too, Lord, that he was prepared to come to his people, the Jew. And Father was prepared to preach the message, to give them a chance to receive him as their saviour. And Father, today specifically we pray for Israel, Father, even as your word tells us to pray for Israel. Father, we just know our responsibility is to preach the good news of Jesus, their Messiah, to them. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name that many of those people might be saved, Father. We pray for a special anointing of the Holy Spirit to even flood the land of Israel. Father, to even flood all the Jews who are in America and in this country, Father that, Father, they might know, Lord, that the Messiah that they look for, many of them with all their hearts, has already come and his name is Jesus Christ. Father, we just ask in the name of Jesus, even tonight, for the peace of Israel, for the peace of Jerusalem. Father, we lift that nation to you and we ask you, Father, to protect that nation in Jesus' name. But, Father, to bring them to a place of repentance, Lord. Father, if they are cutting off, Father, meant that the church came in. Oh, Father, what does it mean when they're all restored to you? But it means life from the dead. Hallelujah. And Father, we know on this earth of ours, Father, there is no such thing as world peace unless the Jews submit to his or her saviour. Father, therefore we ask, Lord, that indeed a great awakening might occur in the land of Israel, that they might indeed have the scales dropped from their eyes. They might have eyes open, ears open, to receive the good news of Jesus and that Father that nation indeed Lord should look upon him whom they have pierced Father and that they might turn towards him and to follow him even faithfully Father even in the way that he laid down his life for them I just pray Father tonight that the words that we uh, think about tonight Father may do something Father in Jesus name to show that Jesus is indeed the great and wonderful Messiah And that, Father, those who listen to this tape might receive the anointing of God upon them. That, Father, their understanding might be quickened in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We're coming very rapidly to the end of the first course of basic Bible studies on prophecy. And you remember, of course, we've been dealing with (coughs) fulfilled prophecy. Now, before we start the second course... on on prophecy, which is unfulfilled prophecy, the prophecies relating to the second advent, relating to the period called the tribulation, relating to the millennium and and to the rapture of the church and all the other uh, wonderful subjects that are involved in, in that part of scripture. I have, of course, to come through now to the prophecies that relate to Jesus in particular. And so beginning tonight and for the next four Bible studies, including tonight, I'm going to be talking about what I call messianic prophecies. Messianic prophecies merely means those prophecies relating to the person of the Messiah. Because we have to see who is the Messiah and how do we know that the Messiah that we believe in really is the true Messiah as revealed in the Bible. Most of us here know our Bible sufficiently well, know our uh, Jewish history sufficiently well to know that the, uh, the Jews have been brought up on a diet of the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the Old Testament. Every day from the year dot, those children were taught Old Testament scripture. Every year through the calendar, they lived events that represented things in their historic past. Every single week they heard certain familiar passages from Deuteronomy especially recited over the meals 
um, every time they got together for prayer, for Bible study. Until, finally, those Jewish children grew up not only to be Bible believers, but actually to be Bible knowers and Bible reciters. Unlike many Christians, of course, who live in our present day and age, who say, oh yes, I'm a Bible believer, and then you say, well, when did you last study the Bible? Oh, well, um, well, uh, I try and read a little bit every day, and that's the type of answer that's given. The Jews knew their Bible and knew it very well indeed in the way Christians ought to know their Bibles. And one of the things that struck every Jew was this, that the Old Testament scriptures kept referring to an enigmatic man, a man that they believed was going to appear on the earth, a man who was going to come who was a Jew, a man who was going to visit their nation, and a man who was going to restore to the nation the place that it should have, to restore to the people their right relationship with God, and was generally going to come to fulfill all the covenants that God had made to Israel. And they looked forward to this man's coming. Every Jewish woman prayed, could I be the mother of the Messiah? She lo- that's, that's the desire of every woman's heart in Israel, that they might give birth to the child who would be recognized as the Messiah who would save his people from their sins. They, l- they longed for it. The beginning of the Passover meal was begun with a woman lighting the candle. Nothing could happen in the festival of the Passover till the woman had actually struck the match or whatever they used in the ancient days and actually applied it to the candle. Because she was saying, unless I and Jewish women like me give birth to the Messiah, there is no redemption at all for Israel. That's what they were saying. And so they longed for this man to be manifested in their midst. Needless to say, the time that they wanted him most was the time when they felt the pinch most or felt the heel of the oppressor upon them. It was always when the armies were surrounding Jerusalem that everyone used to cry for the Messiah. They all used to look out, is the Messiah among us? Lord, is it at this time you'll restore the nation to Israel? Is it at this time Israel's going to become top dog? Lord, we've got the Assyrians outside the gates. Lord, we've got those Babylonians stepping on us. Lord, must we put up with the Persians? They've been good to us, but Lord, shouldn't we be top nation? Oh, Lord, the Greeks, must Alexander trample through our land? That's what they used to say. And then the Romans came along. Lord, send us the Messiah. Where's the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? And so in the land of Israel, they used to get people. People galore coming along. People with political interests. People who felt that their philosophies perhaps would be good for Israel. And they always used to come and say, Hey, I think I'm the Messiah. And people used to say, well, we think you're the Messiah as well. Come on, lead us and let's take the land. That's what they used to do. Now, this man, this enigmatic man, and you notice, by the way, none of the Messiahs have lasted. They never lasted very long. It wasn't long before, actually, uh, the disciples were scattered or they were killed in some way or the whole uh, of the tribe that developed around this man was uh, scattered to the far ends of the earth. But they used to call this man that they were looking for by certain names. The Old Testament laid out the names very clearly. And these actually, although they weren't personal names, they were titles which represented either the ministry or the character of the man they were looking for. Because different Old Testament passages tell a different story about this man. Rather like a diamond having many facets, Uh, different parts of the Bible show a different facet of this man who was coming. That's why they called him such names uh, as these. The branch, they called him. That was a name for him. The branch. The stem of Jesse was a name. It told something about the, the one who was to come. They called him the servant of the Lord. Capital S, capital L. The servant of the Lord. Or they called him the Son of Man. Isn't it funny that we Christians reading our Gospels think that the term Son of Man is a sort of New Testament name? Whereas in Daniel, that's the very name given to this man who was to come. The Son of Man. Or they called him the Rock. Right? Or they they called him other names. The Corner. The Nail. The Shepherd. 
These were titles. Emmanuel, which meant God with us. These were the titles. They weren't to know his real name, his personal name, but they were to know, know certain things about him so that when he did come, they would know that it was he indeed who had arrived. But perhaps the famous name, and the name which was the favourite, was the name that I've already used tonight. They used to call him, above everything else, the Messiah. Now, you may say, well, why? Why didn't they call him the corner more frequently than any other? They called him the Messiah for a very specific reason. The word Messiah, M-E-S-S-I-A-H, and here was the reason that they called him the Messiah. The word Messiah means the anointed one. The anointed one. The one upon whom God has put his specific anointing for a task. Now in the Old Testament, there were certain jobs that you could only do after you've been anointed. And say you were Old Testament folk, one day it could be that suddenly Samuel would appear with, to you he would walk into Chichester and everyone would say, hey, Samuel's in town. And he'd be carrying a horn which had been carved out and he'd f it was filled with oil and he was walking through Chichester balancing the oil in the horn. And you knew that he was going to anoint someone. And you might have been the person. And suddenly Samuel comes up to you and he pours the oil right over your head till it drips down your beard onto all of the, if, well if you're a man, onto all of your clothing until finally it's dripping onto your shoes. And Samuel normally then told you why he had anointed you. I have anointed you for this particular purpose. You see, that's what he used to do. Now, if he, however, it never happened, but say he didn't actually tell you why he had anointed you, you would know, if you were a Jew, that you had now changed your job. Before you used to do this, but since that oil was put all over your head, you've now got a different job. And if he hadn't told you, it would have been one of three jobs that you would have been given. One, you would have suddenly become a prophet. That's quite good, a prophet. So before, you apparently were no prophet. Afterwards, you were a prophet, God's prophet. And normally, of course, the person who anointed you actually said, you are today a prophet. The second thing would have been a priest. So the oil dribbling down your beard onto your garments would suddenly mean you're a priest, rather like ha as happened to Aaron, you remember. This blessing pouring down him, even to his beard. And so you could have become a priest. Those of you who are really good, suddenly you find yourself... Uh, have, that you have become a king in the land. For the kings were anointed. And Samuel, remember, anointed kings, it was part of his job. Now, it was one of those three things that was connected with the anointing. You're either a prophet or you're a priest and you're a king. And do you know why they called this man who was coming the Messiah? Because they believed he was going to be all three wrapped up into one. And so they thought, well, yes, it's nice to know he's the corner. It's nice to know he's the nail. It's nice to know he's the branch. Oh, but praise God, because he's also the anointed one who's going to be king of Israel. The anointed one who's going to be a priest on behalf of his people. The anointed one who's going to be a prophet of God to tell us those things that we are to do. Praise God. So they called him the Messiah. Let's just have a look at a few passages that led them to that conclusion, shall we? Let's begin, first of all, with a book that Moses wrote, the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 18. All right? Deuteronomy and chapter 18, beginning verse 15. Now, remember, this is written about 1600, the date. It depends which chronology you follow but about 1600 is the date that I would put. I give or take 200 years according to your own particular view of that. And here is Moses talking about a man who was to come, the man we've identified as Messiah. And look what he says. He says this to the Jews and he says, verse 15, The Lord thy God, he says, will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. In other words, he's going to be a Jew like you are. Of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Now that is a prophetic word. If you go to verse 18, here's what the Lord says. 
I, he says, will raise up a prophet from among them, among their brethren, like unto thee, Moses, in the way they've listened to you, the way you've led them out of, of Egypt, there's going to be another prophet that I'm going to raise up. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Now the Jews didn't just read that, they knew it. They were looking for this prophet. Whenever a man called himself the Messiah, they asked, is this the prophet? All right, let's have a look at uh, the fact that he's going to be a priest. Turn first of all to that wonderful passage in Psalm 110. Right, Psalm 110, and I'm going to begin verse 1, but verse 4 is the real verse we want. Because this uh, particular passage caused the Jews a great deal of trouble. As far as they were concerned, God was tops and David their king was second. And all of a sudden, they read verse 1 and they thought, hello, it looks as if there's someone else here. Because David is speaking and he says this, the Lord said unto my Lord. Now, to a Jew, that was an incredible statement. David was top Lord, as far as they knew. He was king. If this passage had read, The Lord said unto me, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies of, and all the rest, they could have understood that. But here is David actually saying that the Lord said to his Lord. In other words, he's saying there's someone higher than I am that God actually speaks to. And they couldn't understand who this was. Well, I'll tell you who it was. It was the Messiah that he was referring to. And in verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not repent, and it's talking to this anointed man, thou art a priest forever after the order uh, of Melchizedek. You won't have been in this fellowship too long before you understand what that means. So I'm not going to deal with it tonight. All right? But there is a promise. He's going to be the priest of the people. He's going to be the priest. One prophet, two priests. Let's have a look at another passage that talks about him being king and priest. All right? Turn to Zechariah and chapter 6. Zechariah towards the end of the, the Old Testament. Zechariah. 6 and verse 12 and 13 verse 12 and 13 and look what it says and speak unto him saying thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying behold the man whose name is the branch and he shall grow up out of his place he shall build the temple of the Lord now remember this is said to a group of people who have seen Zechariah building the temple and they're talking about someone else who's going to come who's also going to build the temple. The Messiah. This is, this is. Verse 13. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. That's the king. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of his peace shall be between them both. And there you've got it. He's a prophet, he's a priest, he's a king. And you know, let's turn to just one other scripture while I'm on this subject. Even Hannah prayed a most marvellous prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2 in which she talks as a Jewish woman of this man, this anointed man who was going to come. Uh, turn with me to 1 Samuel 2 and verse 10. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 10. <clears throat> All right, and, and let's have a look. I'll begin verse 9, actually. Here it is. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and look at this, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exhort the horn of his anointed. Messiah is the word, his anointed. The, the anointed one. Now can you see, because of those three things, therefore they started calling him the anointed one who was to come. Alright, now I've said he's enigmatic, yet isn't it amazing? In the Old Testament, 
There are over 330 direct prophecies about this man that we call the Messiah. 330 plus prophecies about this man called the Messiah. Now, why was it that God gave the Jews so many prophecies? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God knew that there were going to be many people who would come to the earth and will claim to be the great saviour of Israel. And so, he gave 330 plus prophecies and the, the idea was that the Jews were to say, oh, you say you're the Messiah, are you? Right, do you mind if I tick off the list? And the idea was they were to start going through Scripture and saying, well, that's true of you and this is true of you, but uh, what about this passage? That's not true of you. And the reason so many were given was this, that many men might have, say, ten of the prophecies apply to them, but very, very few indeed would have more than ten actually applying to them. And the man who came and had all 330 plus prophecies applying to him was indeed the Messiah. Therefore, these were given so that the Jews might not be taken in, in any way. They were given for another purpose, and that is that the Jews who studied these, they knew them, they were in their heads, they recited them. As soon as Messiah came, he would hardly have to announce he was Messiah. They'd all know, because they knew what prophecies there were about him. Can I just show you that in the lifetime of Jesus, this actually is what they started doing. So would you turn with me to John and chapter 7 and verse 40. John 7 verse 40. Actually, just before that, John 7 verse 37. Next week or the week after, I'm going to go to the prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling when he says this. There was a prophecy that the Israelis knew, that the Jews knew, that actually Messiah would fulfill with words very similar to the words Jesus uttered. Look what Jesus says to them. John 7, verse 37. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This, uh, it says, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now they hear that phrase. Now immediately the Jewish mind, unlike the Christian mind, says, hold on, this man is speaking words that only Messiah should be speaking. Could this be the Messiah? Is what they start asking. And if you read on after that, verse 30, uh, verse 40, I beg your pardon, verse 40, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Which prophet? Deuteronomy 18. This is the prophet. Oh, this must be him. In other words, they were using scripture aright. Yes, do you think this is the man, Messiah? And look what other people said. But some said, um, sorry, but verse 41, others said, this is the Christ. Now, what's the word Christ mean? Some people, you know, take the name Jesus Christ and they think it's like the name Dennis Mason or John France or Roger Price, you know. Oh, hello, this is Mr. Christ. That's the type of idea they've got of it. It's entirely wrong. Christ was his title. We could say, for example, Elizabeth the Queen. Now, she isn't Mrs. the Queen or nothing like it. That's her title. She's the Queen. We talk about Julius Caesar. Caesar was his title. He was Caesar. His personal name was Julius, Julius the Caesar. By the way, in the Bible, um, you know that name Ahasuerus that comes up? And people think it's King Ahasuerus. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, Ahasuerus is rather like the name Caesar. And that's not his real name, not at all. Ahasuerus simply means that he was actually ruler in Persia at that time. All right, now Christ is a title. The word Christ is Uh, from the the Greek word Christos, which is from the word kriou in Greek. And kriou means to anoint. And Christos means the anointed one. So when you are actually saying Christ, you are saying that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what you're saying every time you say Jesus Christ is Lord. And in the Bible, you notice, sometimes the name Jesus is used by itself in the New Testament. Sometimes he's called Jesus Christ. Sometimes he's called Christ Jesus. Sometimes he's called Christ. And some Christians, oh, they read through that. They don't think it's important. It's vitally important. 
because the order of the names gives the emphasis of the passage. Sometimes he's called Jesus. He's the one called alongside you. Who, the one who came and died for you. He's the one to whom you can present your problems and your troubles. He's Jesus, your very brother. Sometimes he's called Christ, and that means God's own anointed. And so you get variations of the title. All right, now they start talking then. This is Christ, they say. This is the Messiah. Then they say, but some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Now what are they doing? They're looking at Old Testament scriptures. They're applying them to this man, Jesus. And they're saying, but does he fit? I'm not sure he fits, you know. Shall Christ come out of Galilee? I, can you think of a scripture that says Christ shall come out of Galilee? Don't quite understand it, is what they were saying. And they were right in doing it. All right, then it goes on, verse 42, and they quote an actual scripture. You know, know which scripture this is, Micah 5, verse 2. Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. All right, now that, there it was. But can you see, when Messiah came, he was not only going to say, I am Messiah, he was going to have the Old Testament scriptures prove that he was Messiah. All right, now let's have a look at Jesus. Now we, as Christians, obviously believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The purpose of this course of Bible studies, these four, will be to prove that statement, that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. But let's first of all see, did Jesus claim to be the Messiah? And if he did claim to be the, the Messiah, did he do it right? In other words, did he also claim that he had the full backing of Old Testament Scripture? Because if he didn't, he's not the Messiah. All right? Let's begin in John 4. We're in John quite a bit tonight. We'll be dashing about. John 4. And you'll remember what's happening here. He's speaking to a woman who is a Samaritan. All right? And they're having a bit of a theological discussion uh, by this well. And Jesus here is talking to her and she's trying every get out to get away from this man. And one of the things she says, she doesn't like him talking as he does in verse 24. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And she doesn't understand it. So she says, well, she says, I don't understand it, but the thing I do know, she says, is this, verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, I believe that, she says, which is uh, called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things. In other words, look, please don't talk to me about all this, don't talk all this theology to me, I've got a man coming, like everyone else, um, and this man called Messiah is coming, he'll lead me into all truth. And here is the most amazing of statements, verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he, I am the Messiah. All right? So there is an amazing claim. I am the Messiah, is what he says. But he doesn't stop there. Turn on to John um, 5, John 5, and verse 39, and look what he says later on. Search the scriptures, he says, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And he's talking about these people, these scribes, these Pharisees, these religious people, the religious Jews, and he says, yes, you read the scriptures, sure enough. You read them, you pour over them, you think in them you've got eternal life. He says, yet, he says, look, and yet they are they which testify of me, he says. And this is an amazing claim. He's saying that scripture, words that has been written 1,600 years ago to 500 years ago, before his time that is, actually was all written about him. Now, to the Western mind, you're dealing with a very proud man and you're dealing with an egotist or an egoist, whatever the, distance, uh, the difference between those is. You have a man here who really is claiming things that's quite outside the bounds of human decency. But to the, to the Jewish mind, it wasn't like that at all. A man who claimed things like this was claiming nothing else but that he was the Messiah. Indeed, don't turn to it. In the passage we've just seen, do you remember that the woman left the well? And do you remember what she said? She actually says, come, she says, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Isn't this the Christ? She asks. Isn't this it? Haven't we read in the Old Testament? And this is him? And you remember later on, they, they came to see. 
And they said to the woman, listen, at first we believed because, because of what you said. But now we've been, we've seen for ourselves and guess what? He is the Messiah, is what they actually declared. An amazing uh, situation. You see? Because the words Jesus said convinced totally of the fact that he was the Messiah. Let's just have a look quickly, shall we, at, at what the disciples uh, said about Jesus. For when he was collecting his disciples, why did the disciples follow him? It wasn't because he was such a nice man and had a dynamic personality and all the rest. It was because as Jews they really thought he was the Messiah. Again in John. And isn't it interesting, we're in John, 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 John. I'm going to just pop to Matthew just once, a little later on. We're in John tonight. You see, isn't it amazing? John. And John's busy saying he's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah every time. Turn to John chapter 1. All right? John and chapter 1. And you'll remember that John the Baptist was preaching long before Jesus started his ministry. The period was about three and a half years, though some people put it as little as six months. And it is likely there is evidence that Jesus actually went along and listened to John as he was teaching before he was actually revealed. And John had a whole group of disciples and among them were some of the disciples who later became the disciples of Jesus. And you'll remember what happened uh, in John 1 and verse 41... No, actually, I'm beginning with verse uh, 35. I do beg your pardon. <laughs> verse 35. And here is John continuing his message. He's preparing the way of the Lord. And it says, again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus, who had been in the midst for some time, but suddenly the revelation was given, looking upon Jesus, he said, Behold, see, look, the Lamb of God, he said. The Jewish mind instantly thought of the Exodus, the man who saved them from the oppressor, the one who made sure that death passed uh, over them rather than affecting them because the Passover lamb represented that. And suddenly John says, look, it's the Lamb of God. Here he is. And because of that statement, two of the disciples, if you'll forgive the expression, peeled away from John and actually started following after Jesus. And look what happened, verse 37. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He findeth uh, first his own brother Simon and saith unto him and look at these words we have found the Messiah he says that's it I, I, I found the Messiah he's here on the earth aren't we the most blessed of all generations he's honestly the Messiah there it was I have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ and when he brought him and he brought him to Jesus and when Jesus beheld him he said thou art Simon the son of Jonah thou shalt be called Cephas which is by interpretation a stone. Then they go on. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael had his head screwed on right. And what's his first reaction? Not what Peter said. Oh, how great! Not at all. He said, what? Jesus of, of Nazareth, did you say? Jesus of Nazareth. And then he makes the statement. Oh, he says, Isn't, that's funny. And Nathaniel said unto him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He said, I don't remember a scripture, Old Testament scripture, that says that the anointed one's going to come out of Nazareth. What are you talking Are you sure this is the man, he says? Nathaniel proving that he's a better Bible scholar ever than the others. And look at what it says. And Philip says to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael says, uh, saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, the Messiah. Thou art the King of God 
of Israel. All right, Messiah. It dawns on them. The early disciples followed Jesus because honestly they thought he was the Messiah. All right? Right, keep your finger in the place. We'll be back to John. Turn to Matthew 16 and verse 16. Let's just read this. Matthew 16 and verse 16. And Jesus asked a question in verse 13, Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man, sorry, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? By saying that, he's already saying, I am the Messiah. Daniel 7 calls me the Son of Man, I'm the Son of Man, but who do they think I am? Is what he says. And, and here's the answer. And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Come back to life. That's what they say. And others say you're Elijah. And others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets anyway. Right? Perhaps you're Zechariah, perhaps you're Hosea. But you're certainly one of the prophets. And then he says, but whom say ye that I am? And here Simon Peter says it, and it's a revelation to his heart. And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son, of the living God. In other words, the call of the disciples was all about messiahship. The following of the disciples was all about messiahship. And for our last reference in John, just go to John 20, and you see how John summarizes the gospel that he's written. All right? And verse 30. And perhaps if we read John's Gospel with that in mind, in other words, his own summary in mind, we'd understand it a lot better. All right? And verse 30, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ. I'm writing this that you might know that Jesus is the Messiah, is what he's saying. And that, once you know that, that ye believing might have life through his name. All right, now there's the statement. In other words, Jesus claimed he was Messiah. Jesus claimed that the Old Testament actually supported his claims to Messiahship. And you will find, you can read it for yourself, through the book of Acts, the mainstay of the evangelistic outreach was a proof that Jesus was the Messiah. And funnily enough, there is in the heart of every man the need to follow a Messiah. All the followers of Maharaja Ji are all looking for the Messiah and they think it's Maharaja Ji. He doesn't actually uh, fulfill many of the prophecies given in the Bible. I think about one, uh, as far as I know, out of uh, 330 plus. But don't be surprised that you've got groups like this walking around with their little finger symbols. Don't be surprised. They need Jesus. And they have found him uh, being duped by the devil and being deceived and they're following their Messiah. Communists are following Karl Marx. He's their Messiah. He's the one who has the answers as far as life is concerned. Man needs a Messiah. The moon is. They're only looking for their Messiah. That's all. We know the true Messiah. And John's Gospel is written, and that's why it's so popular among evangelicals, to give to non-Christians, to prove Jesus is the man. Hallelujah. To say every other man is rather a fool compared to Jesus. Every other man has no answers compared to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. And, and Peter preaches to the Jews. He said, Jesus is the Messiah. And he preaches to the Gentiles and he said, Jesus is the Messiah. And that was the mainstay of his message. All right, before I come on to the Messiah, let me just turn to that lovely passage. You knew I'd get there in the end. Luke 24. Because this is the sermon that I wished that I could have heard. And the sermon that I trust in the next three weeks I'm going to give. Hallelujah. That's tall orders. But uh, after all, what is uh, the testimony of prophecy? It is a revelation, isn't it, of Jesus. Hallelujah. And what is the Holy Spirit doing among us but revealing Jesus in our midst? Praise God. And here you've got this most amazing passage. Jesus walks along and he hides who he is. He just joins them and he's listening in and he's saying, oh, you look sad. Hey, what do you look so sad for? It's funny. 
Um, what, what's all this? Uh, has, have things been going on that I know nothing about? That's innocent, you see. And they say, wow, they say, you must be the only man around here that hasn't heard. Isn't that wonderful? In other words, it shows us that when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, millions saw it. Everyone knew what was happening. Praise God. And they say, wow, you're the only chap around here that doesn't know. And they started telling him. But as they were telling him, there was unbelief coming out of their hearts. We were followers. We thought he was the Christ. And the implication is, but of course we were wrong. And what does Jesus say? The most loving words that probably a a person who has the good of his disciples uh, foremost in his mind could say. The most loving words. Look what he says, verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, he said. (laughs) Hallelujah. Um, Literally, O idiots. I don't mind which of those you use. You idiots, he says. Honestly, I've been teaching you for three and a half years. The very things I said to you have come to pass. You fools, and you haven't seen it. Wow, he says, you must be thick up here. Right? That's the amplified version. (laughs) And he says, O fools, and slow of heart to believe. I just pray my own heart that when I reach heaven, God isn't going to say that to me. I had all these glories for you and you didn't believe it. You walked around as if you were the lowest of the low when in my son you were the highest of the high. You walked around as if the devil could kick you around when actually he won the victory. Oh, I hope he never says that. Praise God. Oh, fool, idiot, slow of heart, you are slow of believing. Wow. And then he goes on. And he says, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ, he says, to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, do you see that? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Today, the Old Testament to us is divided into three main sections. We have Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible. Then you've got the prophets, which are the famous prophets, excluding Daniel, by the way. And then you've got the writings in which uh, Proverbs comes and Song of Solomon and the histories and so on. And Daniel comes in there. And when I come on to Daniel, you'll understand why it's put in the writings and not in in the prophets. But in the days of Jesus, the Old Testament was divided just into two sections. They just had the first five books and all the others were called the prophets. And what it says here is, he began with Moses, Genesis, Exodus, and went right through all the books of the Old Testament saying, look, and I'm here. And what do you think this meant? And what do you think that meant? And I wonder whether he covered 330 plus prophecies. <laughs> One day I promised myself I'm going to walk at least part of the way on this road and see whether there's enough time. And there, there is, actually. And I believe Jesus just unveiled the scriptures as far... Yes, right, you can come too. Um, <laughs> and that's my wife, by the way. Um, I believe that Jesus unveiled the scriptures as he went along. He was pointing to passages saying, now why did you know this passage? Why didn't you see it applied to me? Why didn't you see it applied to me? And this one, and this one, and so it went on. And look at this. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. There it is. In other words, Jesus as the true Messiah points to the Old Testament as his authority for saying he is the Messiah. All right. Now, how are we going to take it? How are we going to split up the Old Testament? Obviously, I can't deal with all 330 plus prophecies in the three remaining, three and a bit Bible studies. So, I've divided them up into three main sections and beginning today, we're going to start on the first one and then we're going on to the other. So, I'm going to talk about the Messiah under three headings. One, the pedigree of the Messiah. And that's what I'm beginning today and next time. We'll complete it next time. The pedigree of the Messiah. The second one will be the signs of the Messiah. And the last one will be the life and death of the Messiah as given in the Old Testament and to see whether Jesus actually foots the bill as far as Messiahship is concerned. Now why have I called the first section the pedigree of the Messiah? Simply this, that actually Messiah couldn't just be an, just any old man. Couldn't be. You couldn't just say to one person, oh, you'd be the Messiah. Or could you be the Messiah today? You couldn't do that. 
the Bible laid out clearly certain facts about the life of Messiah and he had to fulfil all of those facts in order to be the Messiah. And so under the pedigree of the Messiah, and I'll probably get through point one today and we'll go on to point two next time, we can see exactly who Messiah had to be. All right? So, let's begin today then with the pedigree of the Messiah. Now, the Messiah is such a vast subject, we're going to have to split it up just a bit. All right. Point number one, as far as the Messiah was concerned. This is the pedigree of the Messiah. One, he had to be human, first of all. That may sound rather strange, but you know, some people honestly believe that the Messiah the realm of messiahship is only found in an inner spirit, in an inner light, in an ethereal being that is going to present the world with salvation. Some even claim that Jesus actually was not human, but he was only a spirit. One, the Bible says that when Messiah comes, he's going to be as human as you or I, praise the Lord. All right, where do we see that? Well, in Genesis and chapter 3 and verse 15. Now, if you have heard, and you should have heard, the tape I have done on the virgin birth, then this is but recap, but for the rest of today, we're just going to look at it again. At the point we come in to this, Adam has fallen and has actually um, brought the curse and the fall upon all of creation. And... God is giving out the blame and giving out the judgment for what has happened. And you remember, I think in that tape, I talk about passing the buck. And they pass, oh, it's his fault. And it's this fault. And it's her fault. And every, everyone's fault except for my fault. And in verse 15, we get an amazing prophecy, a prophetic statement. It says, and talking to the woman specifically, sorry, talking to the serpent, but including the woman in what is being said, And verse 15 says, And I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. You'll notice it's not his seed. It's her seed that's talked of here. He, not it, he shall bruise thy head. And the word bruise means to crush. In other words, when the seed of the woman comes, he's going to smash the head of the serpent. Now, believe it or not, if you tread on the snake's head, it's dead. And this is saying that when the seed comes, whoever he is, it's the end of you, you serpent, you devil. The end. He's going to come along, tread on your head, and that's the end of you. But, he says, there is something else. He shall bruise thy heel. Now, of course, you know that when a snake attacks a man, it puts its fangs into his heel. He's walking along bare feet, and the snake comes up, puts fangs into the heel, and the poison spreads throughout the system. And, of course, when Adam fell, the poison of the fall got into the veins of humanity. But Messiah was going to come, who was going to be born of the woman, that is, a human being, and he was going to stop and undo the work that the devil had done. In, in, as far as the fall was concerned. Now that is what this statement is all about. Praise God. Now Eve got very excited. You know, of course, don't you, it's her seed because of the virgin birth. But we'll see that in just a moment or refer to the tape, please. Eve got awfully excited. You see, she didn't like living in a fallen creation. She remembered the good old days of Eden. In the good old days of Eden, oh, Adam had to work, she had to work a bit, but it wasn't in the sweat and it wasn't toil, it was wonderful. He went into the garden, he picked the grapefruit and came home and said, here you are, there's the grapefruit, darling. And they used to eat the grapefruit, it was super. But once once they had fallen, they found that toil was involved, frustration was involved. All of a sudden they worked and they didn't get all the produce that they were supposed to get. They only got half of it. And she was cheesed off with this. She didn't like it awfully much. So she thought, oh, well, I know what's going to happen. He said, my seed is going to actually crush the serpent's head, so I'm going to have a boy, and he's going to undo everything that my wretched husband has done. That's the type of attitude that was in her mind. So she thought it was easy. All right, you can see that in uh, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. And it says here, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, and there Cain. And Cain means acquired or gotten. Oh, 
Oh, and the yippee of joy came out. Wonderful. Here's the child. Oh, I'm tired of this fallen nature. I really am. Oh, here he is. I've acquired him. And the next phrase says and says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Or some people translate that as, I've gotten the man, even Jehovah. I've got the Messiah, is what she's saying. Here he is, Adam. Messiah's come. And that's what she thought. Wonderful. But as the little cherub grew and grew and grew, it was only clear to her he, he was more like his father than he was like her. And soon this monster was running around the house adding to the chaos of the fall. And she thought, this is dreadful. Terrible. Because she hadn't seen, you see, that it wasn't going to come from Adam. The curse was passed on by Adam. It was going to come through a virgin birth that we'll see next time. So much, actually, was her frustration that when she gave birth to another child, and do you remember, by the way, the fall was getting worse and worse and worse. It was cumulative in its effects. And she still had pain and trouble bearing the child and then giving birth. What did she call him? Well, read on. Verse 2. And she bare again his brother and called his name Abel. Hebel. Vanity. That's what she called him. Vanity. Emptiness. Boredom, monotony, must this go on, is what she's saying. And it is the sheer cry of desperation, because she knew what it was like to be redeemed and to walk with God. She got it right in one aspect, that Messiah, when he came, was going to be a man. She was right there. She hadn't seen that there were other conditions yet to be laid down. All right. Let's leave it at that. So far, Karl Marx fits in as Messiah. So far, Maharaji Ji fits in. So far, the Moonies seem to be right. So far, Jesus fits in as well. Even Sir Geoffrey Howe fits in at this particular point, (laughs) at the moment. Next week, we're going on and we're going to see that gradually you can cast the others out, that only one man fulfills them all. So next week we'll continue with this and we'll talk a bit about the virgin birth. God bless you all. Amen.